Aloha, and welcome to my presentation on Expressionism and the Nazis. So, um, yeah, starting with an image of Hitler uh, walking into the House of German Art. Nice. And then on the left is um, an expressionist painting or portrait of Hitler. The era of German expressionism was extinguished by the Nazi dictatorship in 1933, but its most incandescent phase of 1910 and 1920 left a legacy that has caused reverberations ever since. It was a period of intellectual adventure, passionate idealism, and deep yearnings for spiritual renewal. Increasingly, as some artists recognize the political danger of Expressionism's characteristic inwardness, it became more committed to exploring its potential for political engagement or wider social reform. And this quote is from the book Expressionism by Ashley Bassey. They're just showing the expressionists were a bit rebellious and obviously that's not good for the nazis and unfortunately nazis really went after expressionists as i'll kind of discuss more in detail so we will focus on the uh antarctite kunst Degenerate Art Exhibit. And that's a photo of Hitler um, walking into the Degenerate Art Exhibit. <clears throat> Ziegler opened the exhibit on July 19, 1937 in the gallery at Munich's Hofgarten. The show was a sensation. More than two million came to see the exhibit. As Ziegler said at the opening, around us you see these figments of insanity, of audacity, of good-for-nothingness and degeneration. We are all shocked and disgusted by the sight. Um, the unexpected success of the exhibition inspired a second wave of cons uh, confiscations. Ziegler was instructed to seize more artwork. Around 19,500 pieces were then removed from German museums. There was hardly any protest, says art historian Anja Tiedman, or Tiedman from the University of Hamburg, who has researched the Nazi art dealer Karl Buchholz. Uh, she said, fear of repression was too great. So here's Adolf Ziegler. Um, there's a picture of him standing with his portraits uh, behind him and, uh, sorry, and that was uh, one of the nude paintings that he's, he tended to do a lot of nude paintings, so that was I guess one of his more famous ones, or well-known at least. 
What really finished Expressionism was the brutal and coldly calculated campaign waged against it by the Nazis. They had tolerated and on some occasions even embraced some of the more established products of Expressionism in the first years of the regime. However, deciding finally to demonize it as Wolk, Weirdrich, uh, adversary to the people, and the product of a corrupt past, their vitriol peaked in 1937. This brought the purging of museums and the exhibitions of so-called Entartete Kunst, degenerate art, across the German Reich. In a campaign orchestrated by Adolf Ziegler, the painter, we just looked at some of his work, um, painter of insipid nudes and a favorite of the Führer, or the Führer thousands of works by Nold, Kirchner, Heckel, nearly all the expressionists featured in this book. Um, this is from the book Expressionism, were stripped from public collections. Many were displayed for ridicule, held up as examples of the Republic's wastage of taxpayer money, and then destroyed or sold abroad. Around 16,000 confiscated prints and drawings, or around 16,000 confiscated works were kept in storage at the Ministry for Propaganda. On 20 March 1939, around 5,000 paintings, prints, drawings, most of which were expressionist draw or artists, or by expressionist artists, were burned, having been determined as unvertebrate this stand property of no value. By this time, many expressionists had left Germany. Others were forbidden to work. Some were incarcerated in concentration camps. Uh, so, yeah, we'll look at the House of German Art. It was opened in 1937 uh, with an exhibition of art chosen by Hitler honoring what he called a new and genuine art. It was a celebration of Aryan ideas ideals of racially pure women and men. Um, so on the right is a photo of it back when it uh, was still under Nazi power. And then on the left is a photo of the museum in modern day. And this is a f uh, from a video um, of the inside of the museum and it has just a lot of a lot of nudes in the museum and this is a quote from adolf hitler on behalf of the german people i would like to ban any such pitiful unfortunates evidently the victims of defective eyesight from attempting to bluff the public into accepting the products of their distorted vision as real or even as art. And he said this at the, as an opening remark at the House of German Art. And here are some paintings from the House of German Art. Um, these are on display today. And these are probably from the opening of, well, it's, it can be described as romantic realism. Um, so pretty much trying to make things look as realistic as possible, except um, I guess you could describe it as being in a more uh, romantic sense, as in it's, it's, looks like real life but it's better than real life or more beautiful at least in the eyes of the nazis it was more beautiful 
Um, and then just to also look at one of Hitler's works um, and his work it tends or would, would be described as realism, um, or at least trying to make things look as realistic as possible. Hitler was rejected by the Academy of the Visual Arts in Vienna and never became a recognized artist. For all his life, he insisted that the only true art was art that tried to imitate life. <clears throat> Peter Guntner, um, he was a witness at the House of German Art. He was 17, and he's now an art historian. And what he said about it was, if you really want to look at the two sides of the coin of what is war, look at the Nazis and look at the Expressionists and you'll find out who is who. The German Expressionists were all against the war. There was not an Expressionist who was not against the war. Now the Nazis consider war as the greatest accomplishment of mankind just um, highlighting the differences between expressionists and their viewpoint and uh, the Nazis viewpoint that yeah the Nazis were very pro-war and the expressionists had just uh, experience World War One and the horrors of that, and um, they were very uh, badly affected by war, um, especially mentally, and painted about it. And I think they wanted to protest war. So on July 19th, 1937, the National Socialists, the Nazis, opened the Antarctica Kunst Degenerate Art Exhibit directly across the park from the newly founded House of German Art that had opened the day before. The uh, Degenerate Art exhibit contains 650 items that had been confiscated from 32 public German museums during the previous two and a half weeks and hastily assembled. The confiscation of these works was retrospectively legalized on May 31st, 1938. The museums were never financially compensated and the artists represented were advised to stop painting and many were fired from their academic positions. The first rooms of the exhibit were grouped by theme, religion, Jewish artists, vilification of women, slogans in these and other rooms, scorn, abstraction, and anti-militarism likening this modern art to that of the insane. And this is from an article by J.C. Harris, self-portrait as a degenerate artist. Uh, and here are some photos from the degenerate art exhibition. Um, and um, here are just some of the labels that people or that the Nazis had um, said about these artworks. Nature is seen by sick minds, an insult to German womanhood, crazy at any price. And Kurt Essis. He was 16 years old when he saw the show. 
and just wanted to quote him saying, my teacher said to me, go there and see how degenerate the world has become. The art was shocking. How could people paint like that? We decided it was all garbage or pigsty. Um, so he obviously had a negative opinion about the show um, and just wanted to explore a little bit what degenerative meant to them back then because um, it was something that was kind of it, it used to be a scientific thing that people thought was true um, so is from the same self-portrait as a de degenerate artist article Preoccupation with degeneration had taken hold in the 19th century following several publications by B Benedict Augustine Morel. Um, he found an increased rate of cretinism among, or cretinism among family members, attributed it to hereditary degeneration and extended the idea of degen degeneration to medicine and psychiatry. Lombroso uh, extended degeneration to the social sciences in his work on criminology and described associated stigmata, both physical and psychological. And Max Nordois, 1849 to 1923, physician, critic, and Zionist, widely popularized these views about degeneration extended them to artists and authors in his 1892 book, Entartung, Degeneracy. Nordeau claimed that artists had defective vision that made their work incoherent. Um, George Bernard Shaw uh, re refuted Nordeau's in his essay, The Sanity of Art, and he wrote that art cultivates and refines our senses, which I totally agree with. And by the early 1930s, the concept of degeneration was in decline academically as new interventions for mental illnesses were introduced by Adolf Meyer, uh, Eugene Bloor, Sigmund Freud, hysteria. And by the late 1930s, sterilization too was in decline, thank goodness. Ironically, the Nazis took Nordois' position on degeneracy seriously, but did not refer to him publicly, presenting instead a distorted version of Friedrich Nietzsche's views on degeneracy perhaps because Nordois was a prominent cosmopolitan Jew. So they were totally cool with using old science that um, people had already been moving past. And um, even if it was science that was created by a Jewish person, or some of the science was supported by a Jewish scientist. They just kind of ignored that fact. Um, so just coming back to the music uh, or the exhibit, the degenerate art exhibit, um, saw that there was someone with a negative view of the exhibit when they saw it. Um, however, not everyone had a negative opinion about it. Bernard Schultz, today one of Germany's important abstract painters, was an art student when he visited the exhibit. He said it was packed and most people found the art awful. But there were many students from the Art Academy. We examined the works closely, knowing it could be our last time. 
they'd be burned or God knows what the expressionists in that exhibit were our idols, our gods. So at least there were some people there who could appreciate the exhibit. And I don't know, I think, I mean, here's a photo from the uh, exhibit and kind of looks like these people are appreciating the artwork, I'm not spitting on it at least. Um, and here's just an, uh, another view of that same painting. Here are more paintings and just kind of labeling uh, Yiddish or Jewish. And then putting up more paintings and then uh, more military um, themed painting. No picture gets mercy, propaganda minister Joseph Goebel said that uh, in 1938, and nearly one year later, on March 20th, 1939, more than 5,000 works of so-called degenerate art are alleged to have been burned by Nazis in the courtyard of the old fire station in Berlin. And that was from an article from a website, Conspiracy Swirl, in 1939, not Nazi art burning, saying it was uh, probably true, but trying to prove a conspiracy theory, I guess. Um, pretty much, I think the Nazis tried to cover it up. And there are no uh, photos from that for some reason that they could find from the burning of the 5,000 artworks. So from this show, eight paintings of Oscar Kokoschka, 1886 to 1980, were on display Two of his drawings were placed uh, with one by an institutionalist or institutionalized patient diagnosed with a mental illness. On a wall poster, the viewer was asked which of the three by an inmate of a lunatic asylum. So pretty much kind of like comparing him, Oscar Kokoschka, to um, an inmate of a lunatic asylum or kind of making the comment that you wouldn't be able to tell which was which and of course Kokoschka was shocked to find himself so characterized concurrent with Entartete Kunst on the occasion of his 50th birthday, a major exhibit of his work was being shown at the Austrian Museum in Vienna. He was concerned about the fate of his works on loan from German museums if they were returned to Germany when the exhibit ended. On August 3, 1937, Kokoschka sought legal protection for his artwork from Kurt von Schuschnigg from a premier of Austria, Kokoschka wrote to von Schuschnigg that at the opening of the House of German Art, the German Chancellor himself declared that the pilloried artists suffer from defective vision and called upon the Reich's Minister of Interior to determine whether this defective vision is congenital or acquired. If congenital steps must be taken to ensure that it becomes impossible for them to pass it on and thus propagate the defect. 
In other words, the German Chancellor threatened to have these artists sterilized. Kokoschka pointed out that painting involves far more than copying an object that is imprinted on the retina, that seeing it is an act of the conscious mind. Hence, there can be no fear of defective vision being passed on, despite Kokoschka's protest his artwork was returned to the German Museum. So pretty much Kokoschka was trying to um, argue against uh, the German Chancellor because the German Chancellor was pretty much saying that um, being an expressionist artist was like a disease that and uh, Kokoschka was trying to argue that it isn't contagious you can't like catch expressionism by staring at an expressionist painting so therefore there's no danger in having expressionist paintings Um, but unfortunately, the uh, person he was trying to get protection for his artwork from uh, didn't or wasn't able to give him that protection. So yeah, his works were sent back to the museums, the German museums, where they could be obviously seized by Nazis. And here is a uh, picture of Oscar Kokoschka profile. And here's a nice quote about him. He painted the inner world psychological landscapes. And that was from the Degenerate Art Nazi versus Expressionism documentary. Here's some more about Oscar Kokoschka from the Expressionism book. Oscar Kokoschka painted some of the major works of Expressionism and set a new standard for modern portraiture. Towards the end of his long life, his work was described as eternal Expressionism. So just trying to get to know Oscar Kokoschka better um, to maybe figure out what was it about him that made him, um, him a target for the Nazis. Yet there was, or there has long been a strong tendency among critics and curators to regard his earliest work, particularly from the Vienna years of 1909 to 1914, as his best. Certainly, Kokoschka created some of his most stunningly original visual and literary work during his period. However, during this period, however, he continued to explore the means for powerful expression in painting throughout his life. Kokoschka was also a significant writer and active in cultural politics as an outspoken opponent of the Nazi oppression in his later career. Kokoschka was born in Lower Austria and he made his name while still a student. The 1908 Kunstschau in Vienna uh, with works he produced under the aegis of the stylist Wiener Werkstatt. The already radical and unsettling qualities of his work were recognized early. He was dubbed Oberwildling or Chief Savage. Kokoschka did not train as a painter. He studied other techniques at Kunstgewerbeschule school of applied arts yet he had barely graduated when he began his intensive engagement with the portrait genre and i put some of his paintings at the bottom um landscapes and portraits and uh, i tried to find 
some from his Vienna years. Um, but this is kind of a mixture. And this is the self portrait of a degenerate artist. Um, and this was the painting that he uh, was painting when he found out about his work being in the degenerate art exhibit and um he, yeah he was painting a self-portrait at the time um but he uh, changed the body position so that the arms or his arms were crossed in front of his body perhaps in defiance of the Nazis and he named it self-portrait of a degenerate artist which sounds like a, a political title um, sounds like he's trying to make a statement and speaking up against uh, the wrong that was done to him in total, around 417 works by Kokoschka were seized from collections and declared degenerate and examples of cultural Bolshevism and being a Bolshevist was a bad thing to the Nazis. Vin's Brot was one of his defamed works. Uh, so this is the Tempest or Die Winsbrot, or the painting for which Kokoschka is perhaps the best known, emerged from a passionate love affair he had, which also has become legendary. Um, Yeah, so the title means Bride of the Winds. And the, what Kokoschka said about this painting is, My strongest and greatest work, the masterpiece of all expressionist endeavors. So yeah, just to show off some of his best work, um, which... Oh like expressionist paintings is showing like an inner world um, perhaps what he felt about the love affair that he was involved in just to talk about um, the impact that world war one had on expressionists When war broke out in Europe in the summer of 1914, four years of battle and years more of devastating crisis lay ahead. Uh, military casualties alone totaled an estimated 1,600,000 dead and 4 million wounded. Yet in 1914, as in other countries, Germany's citizens had been gripped by a wave of excitement, whether patriotic or merely adventure hungry, and enthusiasm for the war. Men and boys fell over themselves to volunteer. No one knew then either that Germany would leave the conflict so fractish, or fractious and embittered that its citizens would continue a kind of civil war for years within its borders. This was a period in which many artists' lives were profoundly altered, if not shattered, by war. Um, yeah, just because this war was so uh, impactful to Germany, um, obviously they didn't think that uh, they would um, be on the losing side. And um, it just really greatly affected the country. 
and affected these artists. These artists were sort of like responding to the horrible war. Um, here are just a couple of artworks that were created by different artists um, uh, responding to World War I. These all happened to be painted in 1919. And one is The Widow, too. And it's Colwitz. Um, her response to the tragedies endured during what she called those unspeakably difficult years of World War I and its aftermath. Um, the other one, Heinz Fuchs, uh, titled Workers' Famine, Death is Approaching, Strike Destroys, Work Nourishes, Do Your Duty, Work. And then both of these are images of uh, a death figure. Um, so this one, The Danger of Bolshevism by Rudy Feld, um, described as terrifying death figure reflecting a common fear in the turbulent aftermath of World War I in Germany that the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution in Russia might be replicated in Germany. At the end of the war, like everyone else, German expressionists were faced with coming to terms with the trauma and upheaval of the past few years. Broadly speaking, two common reactions or coping strategies can be discerned. One was an ever deeper immersion in what Eckhart von Sido called the 1920 primitive mysticism transcendental visions of a new pure childlike utopia rising phoenix like from filth and destruction can he continued to spill from the imaginations of expressionists the other significant tendency was towards cynicism protest and negation what makes the post-war german avant-garde so fascinating however is that these two evidently antithetical dynamics often met and mixed within the work of individual artists or groups so just exploring more uh, German expressionists, uh, what they stood for, what their work tended to include, just because I think it's important to examine that, considering Hitler and the Nazis just like mounted a total attack against expressionists. I'm trying to figure out what was it about them that was so terrible and threatening to the in the eyes of the Nazis. Um, one thing I find interesting is the expressionists, according to this um, page's definition of their coping strategies for the war, one was utopia um, and in the Nazis' viewpoint, the Nazis were going for a utopia, um, but it was really only a utopia for Nazis. And um, yeah, the Expressionists are going for a utopia as well. Um, but I imagine it's a very different utopia from what the Nazis envisioned. And then, of course, if their tendency is also towards cynicism, protest, and negation, I mean, obviously, that's directly against what the Nazis kind of stand for. They want uh, sort of like blind following of their leadership. They don't want people to be protesting and negating and thinking for themselves. 
The war shattered Oscar Kokoschka's mind and spirit. Um, these are just more quotes from the degenerate art Nazi versus Expressionism documentary, um, as well as a painting by Oscar Kokoschka. Apparently, this was before he. Well, I read somewhere that it was before he went to war. Um, and that he predicted this wound. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, the main effect of warfare on these painters was to drive them crazy. If you spent the best part of the year in a filthy mud hole with corpses as companions, listening to explosives, watching the people on the barbed wire fall to pieces, you went crazy. And the more sensitive you were, the crazier you went. This was also an age shattered by the crisis of a devastating technological war and in Germany, its most debilitating aftermath. The conflict and trauma of the period is in inseparable from the forms Expressionism took. Just to sort of like illustrate more the effects of war on these Expressionist artists that kind of um, cause them to want to paint the things that they painted. Oscar Kokoschka, self-portrait, one hand touching the face, painted in 1918. Um, so yeah, this is one of Oscar Kokoschka's paintings um, that's kind of more related to the war. Um, during his military service on the Isonza front in June 1916, Oscar Kokoschka suffered from shell shock, forcing an extended stay in a Dresden sanatorium. This expressive self-portrait was created in the Saxon capital, where he was offered a professorship at the Academy of Fine Arts in 1919. It is a visualized autobiographical document of Kokoschka's mental condition during these first Dresden years, which were marked by fears, inner conflict, and restlessness. Kokoschka presents himself with a questioning facial expression and an ambivalent posture of estrangement and compassion. The hand touching the lips appears as a sign of self-doubt and speechlessness in the face of the tragic events of world, the First World War. Um, this was from the Leopold Museum. I mean, obviously, they can't know exactly why he painted this the way he painted, unless they're, like, quoting from something he wrote about. But um, still, I don't know. Certainly, yeah, it's a good portrait to sort of show perhaps some uncertainty, mental uncertainty. And here's another a work by Kokoschka. He writes about it. I exhibited a painting clay or a painted clay bust on a pedestal, which I called the warrior. In fact, it was a self-portrait with a gaping mouth, the expression of a violent cry as far as the Viennese public were concerned. My room was a chamber of horrors and my work a laughing, laughing stock. Every day I found bits of chocolate and other debris in the open mouth of my bust. This was probably girls wanting to add their own gesture of mockery at the chief savage. My much debated sculpture was bought by Adolf Loos, whom I now met for the first time and who kept it until his death. Uh, so yeah, another uh, piece of work that sort um, could be uh, in response to the war and just showing that like Kokoschka already had a hard time with the public um, not taking his work seriously. Um, so obviously it's just that much harder when uh, he's worked so hard to get to a um, high standing as an artist 
and the Nazis just uh, take it away from him and take so much work away from him. And this is Olda Kokoschka, Kokoschka's widow. She said, the reaction in Vienna to his first works was very violent because I think society expected from artists something entirely different. So artists just like pushing the boundaries and the Nazis not liking it, creating uh, propaganda to serve their own purposes. Um, just saying that, yeah that these artists are mentally ill or they're Jewish or they're uh, Bolsheviks or whatnot. And this is from the self-portrait as a degenerate artist article. He had become a vocal and adamant foe of the Nazis who planned to arrest him when they entered Czechoslovakia in 1938. Kokoschka fled to England with Olga before the German invasion. Uh, there he painted a series of anti-fascist paintings, The Red Egg and Schluss, Alice in Wonderland, and That for Which We Fight, which are the three paintings on top. After the war, he and Olga permanently settled at Villeneuve, on Lake Geneva, or Geneva, from 1953 to 1963, Kokoschka initiated his school of seeing at the Academy for Art in Salzburg, Austria. The school would alert students to an awareness of their own existence to which art alone gives form. There are no visual distortion for Kokoschka. He taught a new generation of artists to create, uh, to find the creative inner vision that Hitler despised and sought to abolish. And here's more works by Oskar Kokoschka. Um, these are from 1909, so his Vienna years. And more about expressionists. The Expressionists thought themselves as the mentally ill of art. We stand outside of the institutions as our own language. They, of course, meant it metaphor metaphorically. So, yeah, obviously they were just being sort of like pro protesting the norm and didn't mind labeling themselves as something like uh, the mentally ill of the art world whether or not they actually meant actually mentally ill um obviously the nazis took it way too far and um were calling them actually mentally ill because of their artwork the expressionist qualities um, lying not so much in innovative formal means for description of the physical world, but in the communication of a particularly sensitive, even slightly neurotic perception of the world, which went beyond mere appearances. As in the world of Van Gogh and Munch, individual subjective human experiences was its focus. As it gathered momentum, one thing became abundantly clear. Expressionism was not a style. Historians still disagree today on what expressionism is. Many artists who now rank as quintessential expressionists themselves reject the label. Given the spirit of anti-academicism and fierce individualism that characterize so much of expressionism, this is hardly surprising. Uh, yeah, so just, it's kind of like, no wonder Hitler didn't like expressionists if he thinks that the only real form of art is um, like something that looks like pretty much like real life um, with a romantic quality thrown on top. Um, he doesn't like something that paints the inner world and exposes the inner world of a person's mind or heart 
And that's all. I'm ending with another painting from the Degenerate Art Exhibit. Or a, a room full of paintings in a very large, beautiful statue. Um, but unfortunately, most of this art didn't survive, but some of it did. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Mahalo and tschüss.